a Wikivide Documentaries production. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Enjoy. George VI George VI was King of the United Kingdom and the Dominions of the British Commonwealth from the 11th of December 1936 until his death in 1952. He was the last Emperor of India and the first head of the Commonwealth, known publicly as Albert until his accession, and, Bertie, among his family and close friends, George VI was born in the reign of his great-grandmother Queen Victoria, and was named after his great-grandfather Albert, Prince Consort. As the second son of King George V, he was not expected to inherit the throne and spent his early life in the shadow of his elder brother, Edward. He attended Naval College as a teenager, and served in the Royal Navy and Royal Air Force during the First World War. In 1920, he was made Duke of York. He married Lady Elizabeth Bosline in 1923 and they had two daughters, Elizabeth and Margaret. In the mid-1920s, he had speech therapy for a stammer, which he never fully overcame. George's elder brother ascended the throne as Edward VIII upon the death of their father in 1936. However, later that year Edward revealed his desire to marry divorced American socialite Wallace Simpson. British Prime Minister Stanley Baldwin advised Edward that for political and religious reasons he could not marry a divorced woman and remain king. Edward abdicated to marry Simpson, and George ascended the throne as the third monarch of the House of Windsor. During George's reign, the breakup of the British Empire and its transition into the Commonwealth of Nations accelerated. The Parliament of the Irish Free State removed direct mention of the monarch from the country's constitution on the day of his accession. The following year, a new Irish constitution changed the name of the state to Ireland, and established the office of president. From 1939, the Empire and Commonwealth except Ireland was at war with Nazi Germany. War with Italy and Japan followed in 1940 and 1941, respectively, though Britain and its allies were ultimately victorious in 1945. The United States and the Soviet Union rose as preeminent world powers and the British Empire declined. After the independence of India and Pakistan in 1947, George remained king of both countries, but relinquished the title of Emperor of India in June 1948. Ireland formally declared itself a republic and left the Commonwealth in 1949, and India became a republic within the Commonwealth the following year. George adopted the new title of head of the Commonwealth. He was beset by smoking-related health problems in the later years of his reign. He was succeeded by his elder daughter, Elizabeth II. Early Life George was born at York Cottage, on the Sandringham Estate in Norfolk, during the reign of his great-grandmother Queen Victoria. His father was Prince George, Duke of York, the second, and eldest surviving son of the Prince and Princess of Wales. His mother was the Duchess of York, the eldest child and only daughter of the Duke and Duchess of Teck. His birthday was the 34th anniversary of the death of his great-grandfather, Albert, Prince Consort. Uncertain of how the Prince Consort's widow, Queen Victoria, would take the news of the birth. The Prince of Wales wrote to the Duke of York that the Queen had been, rather distressed. Two days later, he wrote again, I really think it would gratify her if you yourself proposed the name Albert to her. Queen Victoria was mollified by the proposal to name the new baby Albert, and wrote to the Duchess of York, I am all impatience to see the new one, born on such a sad day, but rather more dear to me especially as he will be called by that dear name which is a byword for all that is great and good. Consequently, he was baptized, Albert Frederick Arthur George, at Street, Mary Magdalene's church near Sandringham three months later. Within the family, he was known informally as, Bertie. His maternal grandmother, the Duchess of Teck, did not like the first name the baby had been given, and she wrote prophetically that she hoped the last name may supplant the less favored one. Albert was fourth in line to the throne at birth, after his grandfather, father and elder brother, Edward. He often suffered from ill health and was described as, easily frightened and somewhat prone to tears. His parents were generally removed from their children's day-to-day -day upbringing, as was the norm in aristocratic families of that era. He had a stammer that lasted for many years. Although naturally left-handed, he was forced to write with his right hand, as was common practice at the time. 
He suffered from chronic stomach problems as well as knock knees, for which he was forced to wear painful corrective splints. Queen Victoria died on the 22nd of January 1901, and the Prince of Wales succeeded her as King Edward VII. Prince Albert moved up to third in line to the throne, after his father and elder brother. Military Career and Education From 1909, Albert attended the Royal Naval College, Osborne, as a naval cadet. In 1911 he came bottom of the class in the final examination, but despite this he progressed to the Royal Naval College, Dartmouth. When his grandfather, Edward VII, died in 1910, Albert's father became King George V. Edward became Prince of Wales, with Albert second in line to the throne. Albert spent the first six months of 1913 on the training ship in the West Indies and on the east coast of Canada. He was rated as a midshipman aboard on 15 September 1913, and spent three months in the Mediterranean. His fellow officers gave him the nickname, Mr. Johnson. The First World War broke out a year after his commission. He was mentioned in dispatches for his action as a turret officer aboard Collingwood in the Battle of Jutland, an indecisive engagement with the German Navy that was the largest naval action of the war. He did not see further combat, largely, because of ill health caused by a duodenal ulcer, for which he had an operation in November 1917. In February 1918 he was appointed officer in charge of boys at the Royal Naval Air Services training establishment at Cranwell. With the establishment of the Royal Air Force two months later, and the reassignment of Cranwell from Admiralty to Air Ministry responsibility, Albert transferred from the Royal Navy to the Royal Air Force. He served as officer commanding No. 4 Squadron of the Boys Wing at Cranwell until August 1918, before reporting to the RAF's cadet school at St. Leonard's on Sea. He completed a fortnight's training, and took command of a squadron on the cadet wing. He was the first member of the British royal family to be certified as a fully qualified pilot. Albert wanted to serve on the continent while the war was still in progress, and welcomed a posting to General Trenchard's staff in France. On 23 October, he flew across the Channel to Autigny. For the closing weeks of the war, he served on the staff of the RAF's Independent Air Force at its headquarters in Nancy, France. Following the disbanding of the Independent Air Force in November 1918 he remained on the continent for two months as an RAF staff officer until posted back to Britain. He accompanied the Belgian monarch King Albert I on his triumphal re-entry into Brussels on the 22nd of November. Prince Albert qualified as an RAF pilot on 31 July 1919 and was promoted to squadron leader the following day. In October 1919, Albert went up to Trinity College, Cambridge, where he studied history, economics and civics for a year, with the historian R. V. Lawrence as his official mentor. On 4 June 1920 his father created him Duke of York, Earl of Inverness and Baron Killarney. He began to take on more royal duties. He represented his father, and toured coal mines, factories, and rail yards. Through such visits he acquired the nickname of the Industrial Prince. His stammer, and his embarrassment over it, together with his tendency to shyness, caused him to appear much less impressive than his older brother, Edward. However, he was physically active and enjoyed playing tennis. He played at Wimbledon in the men's doubles with Louis Grieg in 1926, losing in the first round. He developed an interest in working conditions, and was president of the Industrial Welfare Society. His series of annual summer camps for boys between 1921 and 1939 brought together boys from different social backgrounds. Marriage In a time when royalty were expected to marry fellow royalty, it was unusual that Albert had a great deal of freedom in choosing a prospective wife. An infatuation with the already married Australian socialite Sheila, Lady Loughborough, came to an end in April 1920 when the King, with the promise of the Dukedom of York, persuaded Albert to stop seeing her. That year, he met for the first time since childhood Lady Elizabeth Bowes Lyon, the youngest daughter of the Earl and Countess of Strathmore and Kinghorn. He became determined to marry her. She rejected his proposal twice, in 1921 and 1922, reportedly because she was reluctant to make the sacrifices necessary to become a member of the royal family. In the words of Lady Elizabeth's mother, Albert would be made or marred by his choice of wife. After a protracted courtship, 
Elizabeth agreed to marry him. They were married on 26 April 1923 in Westminster Abbey. Albert's marriage to someone not of royal birth was considered a modernising gesture. The newly formed British Broadcasting Company wished to record and broadcast the event on radio, but the Abbey chapter vetoed the idea. From December 1924 to April 1925, the Duke and Duchess toured Kenya, Uganda, and the Sudan, travelling via the Suez Canal and Aden. During the trip, they both went big game hunting. Because of his stammer, Albert dreaded public speaking. After his closing speech at the British Empire Exhibition at Wembley on 31 October 1925, one which was an ordeal for both him and his listeners, he began to see Lionel Logue, an Australian-born speech therapist. The Duke and Logue practiced breathing exercises, and the Duchess rehearsed with him patiently. Subsequently, he was able to speak with less hesitation. With his delivery improved, the Duke opened the new Parliament House in Canberra, Australia, during a tour of the Empire in 1927. His journey by sea to Australia, New Zealand and Fiji took him via Jamaica, where Albert played doubles tennis partnered with a black man, Bertrand Clark, which was unusual at the time and taken locally as a display of equality between races. The Duke and Duchess of York had two children, Elizabeth who was born in 1926, and Margaret who was born in 1930. The Duke and Duchess and their two daughters lived a relatively sheltered life at their London residence, 145 Piccadilly. They were a close and loving family. One of the few stirs arose when the Canadian Prime Minister, R. B. Bennett, considered the Duke for Governor-General of Canada in 1931, a proposal that King George V rejected on the advice of the Secretary of State for Dominion Affairs, J. H. Thomas. Reluctant King King George V had severe reservations about Prince Edward, saying, After I am dead, the boy will ruin himself in twelve months, and, I pray God that my eldest son will never marry, and that nothing will come between Bertie and Lilibet and the throne. On 20 January 1936, George V died and Edward ascended the throne as King Edward VIII. In the vigil of the princes, Prince Albert, and his three brothers took a shift standing guard over the father's body as it lay in state, in a closed casket, in Westminster Hall. As Edward was unmarried and had no children, Albert was the heir presumptive to the throne. Less than a year later, on the 11th of December 1936, Edward abdicated in order to marry his mistress, Wallace Simpson, who was divorced from her first husband and divorcing her second. Edward had been advised by British Prime Minister Stanley Baldwin that he could not remain king and marry a divorced woman with two living ex-husbands. Edward chose abdication in preference to abandoning his marriage plans. Thus Albert became king, a position he was reluctant to accept. The day before the abdication, he went to London to see his mother, Queen Mary. He wrote in his diary, When I told her what had happened, I broke down and sobbed like a child. On the day of the abdication, the Arctus, the Parliament of the Irish Free State, removed all direct mention of the monarch from the Irish Constitution. The next day, it passed the External Relations Act, which gave the monarch limited authority to appoint diplomatic representatives for Ireland and to be involved in the making of foreign treaties. The two acts made the Irish Free State a republic in essence without removing its links to the Commonwealth. Courtier, and journalist Dermot Moore alleged that there was brief speculation as to the desirability of bypassing Albert and his brother, Prince Henry, Duke of Gloucester, in favour of their younger brother Prince George, Duke of Kent. This seems to have been suggested on the grounds that Prince George was at that time the only brother with a son. Early reign Albert assumed the regnal name, George VI, to emphasise continuity with his father and restore confidence in the monarchy. The beginning of George V's reign was taken up by questions surrounding his predecessor and brother, whose titles, style and position were uncertain. He had been introduced as, His Royal Highness Prince Edward, for the abdication broadcast, but George VI felt that by abdicating and renouncing the succession, Edward had lost the right to bear royal titles, including, Royal Highness. In settling the issue, George's first act as king was to confer upon his brother the title, Duke of Windsor, with the style, Royal Highness, 
but the letters patent creating the dukedom prevented any wife or children from bearing royal styles. George VI was forced to buy from Edward the royal residences of Balmoral Castle and Sandringham House, as these were private properties and did not pass to George VI automatically. Three days after his accession, on his 41st birthday, he invested his wife, the new queen consort, with the Order of the Garter. George Vi's coronation at Westminster Abbey took place on 12 May 1937, the date previously intended for Edward's coronation. In a break with tradition, Queen Mary attended the ceremony in a show of support for her son. There was no durbar held in Delhi for George VI, as had occurred for his father, as the cost would have been a burden to the government of India. Rising Indian nationalism made the welcome that the royal party would have received likely to be muted at best, and a prolonged absence from Britain would have been undesirable in the tense period before the Second World War. Two overseas tours were undertaken, to France and to North America, both of which promised greater strategic advantages in the event of war. The growing likelihood of war in Europe dominated the early reign of George VI. The king was constitutionally bound to support Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain's appeasement of Hitler. However, when the king and queen greeted Chamberlain on his return from negotiating the Munich Agreement in 1938, they invited him to appear on the balcony of Buckingham Palace with them. This public association of the monarchy with the politician was exceptional, as balcony appearances were traditionally restricted to the royal family. While broadly popular among the general public, Chamberlain's policy towards Hitler was the subject of some opposition in the House of Commons, which led historian John Grigg to describe the king's behavior in associating himself so prominently with a politician as the most unconstitutional act by a British sovereign in the present century. In May and June 1939, the King and Queen toured Canada and the United States. From Ottawa, they were accompanied throughout by Canadian Prime Minister William Lyon Mackenzie King, to present themselves in North America as King and Queen of Canada. George was the first reigning monarch of Canada to visit North America, although he had been to Canada previously as Prince Albert and as Duke of York. Both Governor-General of Canada Lord Tweedsmuir and Mackenzie King hoped that the King's presence in Canada would demonstrate the principles of the Statute of Westminster 1931, which gave full sovereignty to the British dominions. On 19 May, George VI personally accepted and approved the letter of credence of the new U.S. Ambassador to Canada, Daniel Calhoun Roper, gave royal assent to nine parliamentary bills, and ratified two international treaties with the Great Seal of Canada. The official royal tour historian, Gustav Langteau, wrote, The Statute of Westminster had assumed full reality, and George gave a speech emphasizing, the free and equal association of the nations of the Commonwealth. The trip was intended to soften the strong isolationist tendencies among the North American public with regard to the developing tensions in Europe. Although the aim of the tour was mainly political, to shore up Atlantic support for the United Kingdom in any future war, the King and Queen were enthusiastically received by the public. The fear that George would be compared unfavorably to his predecessor, Edward VIII, was dispelled. They visited the 1939 New York World's Fair and stayed with President Franklin D. Roosevelt at the White House and at his private estate at Hyde Park, New York. A strong bond of friendship was forged between the King and Queen and the President during the tour, which had major significance in the relations between the United States and the United Kingdom through the ensuing war years. Brought to you by Wikividi Documentaries. Would you like to know more?